Oberon, the whimsical but good-natured fairy king that spends his free time playing the game Among Us. But what about the Oberon of Fate Grand Order? How well does he compare to his mythological and literary counterpart? And what grade would I give his depiction? Let's find out. Now before I go any further, fair warning, this video is going to spoil Lost Belt 6, Avalon Le Fay, the most recently released main story chapter on N.A. So if you have not played through that story, you really should go do that. Seriously, it's a great story. Now with that warning given, let's continue. Oberon is the herald of a new extra class in FGO, the Pretender class. Pretender class servants are those who take on a false identity to cover up their real one, and one that is done so well that it fools most everyone. Now, at the time of recording, Oberon remains the only pretender released upon the NA version of the game. While I know that other servants of this class exist on the JP version, at the moment, Tlaloc is the only one whose characterization I'm familiar with. In any case, Oberon being the founding member of this class kinda makes determining whether or not he is suited for it a moot point. The pretender class was literally made for him. With that said, Oberon could potentially qualify for other classes. His extensive use and involvement in magic could be a window into him being a caster. He is also said to have possessed a magic bow, leaving an opening for him being an archer as well. Also, since fairies were said to ride upon insects, which you see when he shrinks and rides upon Blanca to go scouting, he could even be a rider as well. And, as it happens, you are able to use Oberon as a story support archer in section 13-6, as well as either a rider or caster in section 14-2 depending upon your dialogue choice. I'd say this opens the door for future versions of Oberon, but I doubt it. He's already gotten a summer costume in lieu of a summer version on the JP version. Two summer costumes, no less. Getting into his character design, Oberon in his first two ascension forms very much looks the part of a fairy king, with fancy fairy tale like clothing and those big butterfly wings. Now, Oberon is the first character I have covered who is not merely a fictional character, but also one found in mythology. I'll get more into this when I get into characterization, but as a teaser, there is quite a bit of variation in Oberon's depiction depending upon the stories that he appears in. His earliest depiction with the name Oberon, or rather Oberon, comes from a 13th century French poem called Huon of Bordeaux. Wait, Oberon was French? No wonder he wanted to destroy Britain. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Oberon being a fairy king doesn't really have a nationality, and while his first appearance with this name came from a French poem, his earliest appearance overall is actually German. More on that later. Anyway, going back to that poem, the Oberon there is described as being a dwarf. No, not a Tolkien dwarf, but someone of below average height. But the fairy who cursed him to this height decided to make him really attractive to make up for it. In Shakespeare's A Midsummer's Night's Dream, though, Oberon has a more average height, and since that is the most famous work that Oberon is in, it makes sense that that is what he is primarily based upon. One other thing from this French poem about Oberon's appearance is that he wears a gown covered in glowing jewels. While he doesn't have that in FGO, his crown at least is a circlet of glowing jewels, so that's something at least. Then, just to make things even more confusing, other depictions of Oberon I've come across give him a more nature-y, wood elf sort of vibe, which is how he's usually depicted in A Midsummer's Night's Dream. Between all of these clashing depictions of Oberon, what we've ended up with is a fancily dressed fairy king who takes some elements from past depictions. It is yet another version of Oberon to add to the collection that already exists in past literature and mythology. However... For those of us who have finished Lost Belt 6, which should be everyone watching this video, we know that there is another side to Oberon, his true identity masked by his pretender class. Vortigern, the Vile King, emerges in Oberon's third ascension form, giving a much darker take on the fairy king Oberon. Everything that existed before has been twisted. His butterfly wings are now dragonfly wings, his combat style becomes much more brutal, his shining gold crown is now a pale blue, and his entire color scheme has become dark and menacing. He has added some new features as well, particularly that insect-like left hand. He is still wearing a fancy shirt that could have fit in with his earlier form, but that only seems to further emphasize just how drastic a change Oberon has gone through. You may only see him like this at the very end of Lost Belt 6, but Oberon's shift to his true form of Oberon Vortigern very successfully visualizes his change from a silly fairy king to a dark prince of destruction. 
Now while the shift from Oberon's first and second ascensions into his third is some amazing artwork, does it connect to the character of Vortigern? Well, barely. I'm going to have a lot to say about Vortigern once we get into characterization, but for now I'll stick to two things. First, the subtle link to Vortigern in Oberon Vortigern's design lay in his wings. Dragonfly wings. Dragonfly wings. Vortigern has a connection to a white dragon, but since Oberon has the nature fairy thing going on, it would be weird if he suddenly transformed into a dragon, right? So instead, the artist gave him dragonfly wings as a nod to the original Vortigern being associated with dragons. The other connection is more about the color scheme used in the Third Ascension. In Artoria Alter's interlude, Sean Alter calls her a clone of Vortigern. Oberon Vortigern does have a dark color scheme like Artoria Alter does, but he lacks the armor and the unholy sword. This is going to be a recurring theme, that in Oberon's FGO portrayal, he's actually better at being Oberon than he is at being Vortigern. Moving on to a skill set, Oberon's first skill is Evening Shroud, which is a special charisma skill to draw allies into Oberon's realm of dreams, giving them some nice buffs as a result. If this sounds familiar, it should, because you see a very similar skill in Merlin's kit as well. In FGO, Oberon and Merlin are similar in the sense that both of them are involved with dreams, with Oberon bringing the protagonist into a dream after his defeat. But because Merlin and Oberon have very different views on humanity and Caldeus' mission, their skills are slightly different, with Merlin's giving an attack buff and MP charge, while Oberon's is an MP buff and an MP charge. Their opposing natures and Oberon's efforts to conceal himself from Merlin are also the reasons why Oberon has that anti-humanity class skill that gives Merlin's skills a chance to fail. Oberon's second skill is Morning Lark, which is a large MP charge and star bomb meant to represent when one wakes in the early morning, a rush of energy upon starting a new day. This burst, however, quickly fades, and so you end up losing some MP charge after that turn ends. In other words, it is a kind of sending off of sorts. Oberon brings the whole party into his nighttime realm of dreams with his first skill, but then can use this skill, Morning Lark, to awaken someone the next morning with a burst of strength but one that has a very notable drawback of seeing that strength vanish shortly afterwards. But Oberon's signature skill is, without a doubt, his third one, Ending of Dreams. This skill gives a colossal boost of power to a character for a single turn, but once that dream ends, that character will never wake up again. Now, you may have noticed by now that all three of Oberon's skills have a very strong connection to the idea of dreams, waking up from dreams, or never waking up from dreams. So based on this, Oberon must be entirely about dreams, right? Well, no, there is more to him than that. While it is true that the mythical Oberon did reign over the nighttime hours and dreams, it was only one ability he had at his disposal. Like many fey creatures, Oberon also had considerable skill when it came to healing and the creation of potions. This is most famously seen in Shakespeare's A Midsummer's Night's Dream, when Oberon created a concoction that, when applied to the eyelids of someone asleep, will cause that person to fall in love with the first person they see upon awakening. This solution ended up being at the center of the plot of that play, causing all sorts of shenanigans. Oberon ends up solving the mess by having all concerned fall asleep, then to use his magic to persuade them that the chaos was all just a dream, allowing everyone to awake and have their lives return to normal. The full extent of all of Oberon's powers and abilities is unclear, deliberately made so in the myths that feature him, no doubt to further add to his mystical nature. But what is clear is that he was more than just someone who ruled over dreams and the nighttime hours. Oberon's noble phantasm, or rather his first noble phantasm, is Rai Rime Goodfellow, which transforms enemies into a spiritual form and casts them into a separate realm of dreams. If the enemies manage to survive this, they end up in this other realm that, while they cannot be harmed while within it, has still cut them off from the real world. In other words, it's a dream thing again, but since Shakespeare's Oberon did play with those a good bit, I'd say it works well as an MP. It's his skills that I wish there was more diversity in. Similarly, the name of this MP is also related to Shakespeare, specifically the Goodfellow part. Robin Goodfellow, nicknamed Puck, was Oberon's minion in Shakespeare's play who both helped him to create that love potion, but was also the one who screwed up and applied the potion to the wrong people, causing the play's main drama. Robin Goodfellow is also, of course, the name Oberon gives to his miniature rider form that he goes scouting with. <laughs> When Oberon shifts to his third ascension, his MP changes as well to lie like Vortigern. 
In game mechanical terms, it does the exact same thing as Rai Rhyme Goodfellow. We just get a very different visual for it. This time, Oberon Vortigern shifts into his abyssal worm form, sucks in all the enemies, and they fall into that bottomless pit. Now based on what we see of this in Lost Belt 6, this MP really should be an instant kill attack since unless you manage to defeat Oberon, but then again the enemies are still in the field as is Oberon, so they would potentially be able to kill him. Yeah, I'll get a headache if I keep going down this rabbit hole. Anyway, so what connection does this MP have to Vortigern? Well, aside from having his name in it, none. I mean, I guess we could make the argument that since it is a darkened and evil version of Oberon's MP, it kinda has that, but really, that's just stretching things to try to make a connection. This has nothing to do with Vortigern. Oberon's craft essence is a pavane for the deceased princess, which depicts Blanca in a field of snow, either sleeping or dead. It is hard to tell. Alas, I almost have this Bon CE unlocked on my own Oberon, but not quite in time for this video, sadly. I'll probably get Bon 10 during the Christmas Lotto event. Anyway, so what's this CE about? Well, it is actually about Blanca and her connection to Oberon as he arrived in the Welsh forest, about her trying to be there for Oberon and to help him as much as she could. We remember that Blanca did die near the end of Lost Belt 6, absorbing all the curses that Kernonos had directed in Oberon's direction. Upon realizing this, Oberon expressed his disinterest and tossed her body off of the storm border. However, I've always thought of this as Oberon actually being truly saddened by Blanca's death, but that since everything he says gets twisted into a lie, he decided to express the opposite instead. She was, after all, the closest thing he had to Titania in the British Lost Belt. That's just how I saw it, at least. Suffice to say, this craft essence has everything to do with Oberon in Lost Belt 6, and nothing at all to do with the mythical and literary Oberon, never mind Vortigern. Now, at last, we move on to characterization. Let's start with Oberon's origins in our own world's myths. His first appearance is found in Germanic literature, where he goes by the name of Albrecht. This isn't even a proper name in Old German, with it simply meaning Elf King. His most notable appearance in Germanic myth is in the Nibelungenlied, where he guards the treasure of the realm of Nibelung, but is then overpowered and defeated by someone else we know, Siegfried. Alberich then swears fealty to Siegfried, guarding the treasure on his behalf. This stockpile of treasure, by the way, is where Siegfried finds his sword, Balmung. The character was then brought into French literature with the aforementioned French poem of Huon de Bordeaux, whereupon his name changed from the German Alberich to the French Oberon. In this poem, Oberon assists the main character Huon in a number of trials he had to undertake in order to earn a pardon for killing the son of the emperor in self-defense. It was in this poem that we also got Oberon's origin story, that bit I mentioned earlier about him being cursed to a shorter height, but getting a handsome appearance in exchange. He was also of a similar stature in the Nibelungenlied, but he didn't get this kind of backstory there. It is in this poem that we get much of what forms Oberon's identity the fairy king with extensive powers in both magic and medicine, a substantial amount of wealth and treasure, owner of magical artifacts like that magic bow I mentioned earlier, a horn that can cure sickness, and even a magical cup that sounds suspiciously like the Holy Grail. Oberon appears in a few more French stories of the medieval period, with one of them even claiming that he is the son of Julius Caesar and Morgan Le Fay. What? I mean, I know Caesar did go on many lewd adventures, but Morgan Le Fay, too? Obviously, this isn't part of FGO's canon, because if it was, I think Cleopatra would have some serious issues with one of Caesar's former lovers also being in Chaldea. Anyway, then Shakespeare shows up, learns about Oberon from reading the French literature, and decides to borrow him for his play A Midsummer's Night's Dream, while also changing his name to the English Oberon. This is Oberon's most famous story, depicting him as the whimsical, selfish, but ultimately good-natured fairy king who gets into an argument with his queen Titania that ends up leading to the main events of the play. However, much of Oberon's abilities and possessions are not part of Shakespeare's play, and so FGO's Oberon loses out on much of his former power. I mentioned before that in earlier depictions, Oberon was said to possess a vast amount of wealth, and yet in Lost Belt 6 he is in debt to basically everyone as he works to build the Round Table army. No wonder Oberon hates Shakespeare so much. He took all of his money. As you may have noticed, Oberon in one form or another has crept up in quite a variety of works of European literature and mythology, to such an extent that it is hard to pin down everything about him. It also made researching for this video a total mess, and I haven't even gotten to Vortigern yet. But to sum it up, the Oberon of FGO does bear a good amount of resemblance to his other depictions, particularly the one from Shakespeare. He is mischievous, causes a fair amount of trouble, can be selfish and whimsical, but still remains friendly and good-natured. 
Even if all of it is ultimately a lie as he manipulates everyone to serve his own agenda, Oberon makes for good company during the long epic adventure through the British Lost Belt. Now, what about Vortigern? How connected is FGO's Oberon Vortigern to him? Now we get to shift from German mythology, French literature, and Shakespeare to instead look at real history and Arthurian legend. Wait, real history? Yes, actually. Now while the details are murky due to the chaotic nature of 5th century Britain, chances are either Vortigern or someone who fulfilled a similar role to him did indeed exist. By this time, the Western Roman Empire was cracking apart, with less than a century left to live. To try to shore up its home defenses, and having always had problems holding onto it, the Romans pulled out of Britain in the year 410. Sometime around the year 428, faced with the threat of the Picts to the north of Hadrian's Wall in what is today Scotland, and now without Roman support, the rulers of Britain made the fateful decision to reach out to the Saxons to help fight off the Picts. This turned out to be a very bad idea. The Saxons effectively seized control of the nation they had been invited to protect. The decision to ask for Saxon support has become linked to the character of Vortigern. This is where we transition from real history to Arthurian legend. In those stories, Vortigern plays a much more prominent role in the beginning of the tale of King Arthur, or rather of his father, Uther Pendragon. Vortigern had been a nobleman in the British court who then seized an opportunity to take power. King Constantine had been assassinated, and his eldest son Constance had risen to the throne, but he was a weak ruler. Vortigern took advantage of this, amassing power for himself before hatching a plot to hire some picked guards for the king, who then assassinated the young king. Of course, Vortigern then had these picked guards executed for murdering the king, then seizing the crown for himself. The two infant brothers of the slain King Constance, Aurelius Ambrosius and Uther Pendragon, were taken across the channel to Brittany. It was during Vortigern's reign that, seeking support against the Picts and wooed by the daughter of the Saxon warlord Angist, that Vortigern allowed the Saxons to settle in Britain in exchange for their help in fighting the Picts, and marriage to Angist's daughter, Rowena. Things went completely downhill from there, with Vortigern ending up as little more than a puppet to the oncoming tide of Saxon invaders. Eventually, the two brothers of the previous king, Aurelius Ambrosius and Uther Pendragon, returned to Britain and vanquished Vortigern, though one of Vortigern's sons would poison Aurelius Ambrosius shortly afterwards, leading to Uther Pendragon, the future father of King Arthur, ascending to the throne. Now, there is a reason why I went through all of that, and it is time to reveal why. Early on in Lost Belt 6, Da Vinci gives us a rundown of the Arthurian legend while at the inn in Salisbury, and there is a very notable difference between the story Da Vinci tells and the story of Arthurian legends that I have come across. That in Da Vinci's, and by extension the Fate franchise's version of the tale, Vortigern kills King Uther, and that it is Arthur that later defeats Vortigern. But in standard Arthurian legend, it was actually Uther and his older brother Aurelius Ambrosius who killed Vortigern. In other words, fate made a pretty substantial change to Arthurian legend, because King Arthur wasn't even alive when Vortigern was slain, much less to be the one who slew him. Now, there are similarities between fate's Vortigern and the Vortigern of Arthurian legend. They are both characterized as usurpers, tyrants who sold Britain out to the Saxons, and villains who plunged Britain into the chaos that King Arthur later had to fix. But aside from this depiction of Vortigern being the source of the troubles that King Arthur had to defeat to establish his kingdom at Camelot, these are two different Vortigerns. So what else can I really say other than that the Vortigern half of Oberon Vortigern is a different person? And that is even before we take into account that this is actually Lost Belt Vortigern, not proper human history Vortigern, who is pretending to be proper human history Oberon. To sum it up, Fate's version of Vortigern has a very different story from the established Arthurian legend. And now for the verdict. What grade would I give Oberon's depiction in Fate Grand Order? Well, it is a bit of a mess. His character design is quite good, especially as a work of art in the transition between the fairy king Oberon to the vile king Vortigern. His skill set in MP perhaps puts more emphasis than it should on Oberon's powers over dreams, but it still works just fine. In characterization, while there are some changes, it is still in personality a similar Oberon to the one found in Shakespeare's play and in past depictions of the character. But Oberon is only pretending to be Oberon. His real identity is Vortigern. And when it comes to his accuracy as Vortigern, frankly, it's a fail. Yes, I know that this is Lost Bell Vortigern, not proper human history Vortigern, but even the proper human history Vortigern has had significant changes made to his story. This isn't like how it has been for previous servants I have covered where a detail may have been missed or overlooked. This is flat out wrong. 
So, in what is a rather amusing situation for a pretender, the servant Oberon is better at pretending to be Oberon than he is at actually being Vortigern. Now what do I do about a grade here? Well, for his Oberon side I'd give him a C+, but for his Vortigern side I'd go as far as to give him an F. Yes, seriously. I did not come into this video expecting that my first F would go to the Vortigern half of Oberon Vortigern, but because this is all one character, I'm gonna have to average this out. So for a final grade, I am going to give Oberon, Fairy King and Destroyer of Fairy Britain, a D+. Now I must emphasize that these grades are purely for how accurate a character's depiction is when it comes to their established history or legend. It is not a reflection of my personal opinion on a character or what I think of their depiction. If this was me grading my opinion of Oberon in FGO, then I'd be giving him an A, if not an A+, because he is arguably the MVP of Lost Belt 6, Avalon Le Fay. Without Oberon, I don't see how the story of the British Lost Belt would be as good as it is, even if Queen Morgan herself is a contender for that MVP title. But as good as his character is in the story of Fate Grand Order, Oberon, especially his Vortigern half, diverges too much from established legends and myths for me to give him a good grade. If you would like to know more about another character who messes with dreams, check out my video on Edmond Dantes right here. Until next time.